This is the diner at the edge of the universe where anyone is welcome. No matter what corner of the galaxy you come from, you're welcome. Even this guy. Mate, you're talking to me, mate? Gavin, my permanently inebriated friend. God bless him. Amen. Guys, no matter what you believe, uh, if you're an atheist, if, you, if you're not sure what you believe, if you're a cynic, if you're a skeptic, whatever you believe in, you're welcome here, except for the Tooth Fairy. I like the Tooth Fairy, mate. Guys, if you got sent this link by a Christian friend of yours, they want to brainwash you. He's trying to, he's going to brainwash They you. want to take a giant Bible and bash you on the head repeatedly. That sounds like fun, mate. <laughs> Count me in. Well, the opposite <laughs> is actually true. Ah. That person who sent you this link, they're actually doing that because they love you. Boring, mate. And they've seen something that's totally revolutionized their lives and how they see the whole universe. And just maybe, at the end of this video clip, your life might change as well. Let's find out. Welcome to Epiphanies. I grew up just like you, born on planet Earth. I was a good kid and I believed what everyone else believed. But soon enough, the questions I had outgrew the answers people gave me. So I started searching. I heard rumors of a place at the edge of the galaxy where you could ask anything on your mind and you'd find an answer. My journey took me halfway across the universe until finally I got there. But the person that I found there wasn't the person that I expected. Suddenly I had this thought, I just knew that if I take a seat at his table, my life will never be the same. I still don't know where that thought came from, but I guess that's why they called it an epiphany. So guys, what can you expect from this very first episode of Epiphanies? Well, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the question. How do you not freak out when everything is falling apart? Uh, we've got an international speaker who's going to be trying to answer that particular question all the way from your planet on Earth, from a place called England. I know England. That's nice. That's, uh, that's the place with the Queen. That's right, that's the place with the Queen. Yeah, she's a good one. She's a great queen. Well, one. I haven't met the queen personally, but I hear good things about her. Yeah, she's a great queen. Hey, you know what? Maybe one day we can go to England together, hang out in England. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. Two quick things. The first thing is that at the end of this broadcast, we're going to be having Zoom rooms, which we're going to open up, uh, and we'd just dig it for you to come and hang out with us on those rooms. No matter where you are on Earth, um, we've got people in your area um, who would love to meet with you. So you can message this number at any moment throughout the show and say Zoom room and we will reply with the right link. And you can click on that link and you can right there be on a Zoom room. They'll start just as this thing ends, guys. And if you're watching this in the future, this number will still be active. There's a human being at the end of this number. So just drop us a message and we would love to just kind of connect with you guys like that, okay? Then the second thing is that we're gonna be talking about big questions on epiphanies. But when you're talking about those things, they ultimately come down to one historical figure. Uh, his name was Jesus. You've probably heard of him. Amen, mate. Now don't just uh, zone out just yet. Because the thing about Jesus is this, so many of us have heard that name, but so few of us have actually experienced who he is. Now, this is where things get a little bit crazy. Could it be that Jesus, who lived 2,000 years ago and walked the earth and built furniture and ate shawamas, could he actually still be alive today? So, I have come across uh, some videotapes, guys, from your planet. Amen. Let's hear what these guys have got to say. Okay, not that one. No, this guy's a little bit cheesy. Yeah, this one. Okay, so listen to this. I really want to explain my faith to you properly. I don't think I've ever done that. And especially in light of the fact that people around us are getting infected with a virus that we're locked down in our houses, that the future is not certain. I haven't told you this before because I have tried to be sensitive to the fact that you think my faith is a big fat joke. But I'm over that now because it's Corona time and everybody's possibly perishing. What? When I was 17, I decided I wanted to find out these answers. I bought this book about the philosophy of religion because I wanted to understand 
which religion was true because obviously there's a lot of religions. So I'm like, which is the religion? While I was reading this book and learning about different religions, God, where are you? Hello, hello. I prayed and I said, God, which faith is it? Where do I find you? You know, if you're real, then you can surely hear me right now. And so I want to know if you're real and I want to know where to worship in a sense or where to like pledge my allegiance. It was funny because like in the middle of this process of like seeking intellectually and wanting to line things up intellectually, it felt like God wanted to answer the question on a very spiritual level for me that he wanted to like just kind of address me in person. And so I remember that like while I was busy praying by myself and saying, God, where are you? Hello, hello. I started to experience God actually coming and showing up in the room. Christianity wasn't appealing to me in a lot of senses because when I was younger, we used to go to a church and I really disliked it. And it was just a lot of, it felt like rules to me. It felt like a lot of things that I needed to do to keep God happy. And I didn't even understand why I needed to keep God happy. Like why wasn't God independently happy? Why did I have to do stuff? So I didn't, I didn't pray to Jesus initially. I just prayed to God and I said, who and what? And like, where is the way and the truth? I felt Jesus' presence come into the room and I knew that this was a supernatural experience. I started to have very radical supernatural experiences um, just through asking him to show up. But the thing is, which was interesting for me at the time, is that I had obviously done a lot of bad stuff. One of the first things that I felt was that I needed to deal with the guilt. I didn't feel like I could just keep going the way that I was. I needed to deal with the stuff that I'd done wrong. And because I was familiar with the teachings of Jesus, I knew that I probably needed to talk to him about it or something. I prayed to him and I, was, I asked him essentially to forgive sin. Once I had said, look, I acknowledge that I have done a lot of bad stuff. Um, and some of it's like medium bad, some of it's like really well done bad. When I actually brought that stuff to him, there was this insane, insane grace. It's, grace is so hectic. I remember like praying for forgiveness and being completely, completely shocked that he would choose to forgive me. I knew he would forgive me. It was the weirdest thing. I was like, I've done all of this stuff. And I just knew that he was gonna forgive me and that he was gonna completely cleanse me. And I felt it happen. I felt something in my spirit be cleansed and made alive and different than it was before I'd prayed to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. It's funny like to describe the presence of God. Basically, if I had to really try and describe it, like there's lots of vibes, but one of the vibes is is like this very incredibly comforting peace and but it's not just like oh I feel peaceful because things are pretty around me. It's like it's a presence of peace. It's like a thick quality that comes in. It's like a cloud, but it's a cloud that's living. And there's like this thing and it comes over you and it goes into your being and you feel like a deep sense of I'm loved and accepted and God is with me. And it's not like an abstract sort of new agey vibe. Like sometimes you think, oh, the energy. It's not the energy. It's this incredible personality who's so full of love and so different, but better, but also not different. Like <laughs> just the best thing you can imagine. So there you have it guys. That lady plus many others claim to have seen and experienced Jesus in our day and age on earth. I've got a name for that. Stark raving mad. They may be stark raving mad, but what happens if they're not? What happens if this whole thing is actually true, right? If Jesus is alive? And that's the question really, that's what it all comes down to. So guys, we're about to cut across to the guy from England, Jonathan. I'll be in England. And as we do that, I just want to ask you guys one thing. Just have an open mind. He's going to get a little bit Christian. I'll be honest, he's going to throw out words like church and Bible and sin and that kind of stuff. Don't freak out. Amen. Because the reality is this. If there's a chance that this thing is real, then it's worth giving it a shot. Like the odds are in your favor. May they ever be in your favor. Oh, is it this vibe? I think it's three fingers. You're boring, mate. Okay, so let's connect to Jonathan right now. I can see he's actually dialing in, but the, the Wi-Fi in this place is not the best, I will admit. I often come here for some poetry, just, just journaling, this kind of thing, and uh, yeah, they only give you 500 trigabytes a second, which is super lame. Mate, 
You're wasting your time. He's gonna get, he'll get there, he'll get there. Yeah, the Wi-Fi doesn't work. He will get there. It's broken. Okay, if God is real, come in three seconds. Now you're wasting three, your time, mate. Two. It's not, it's one. <laughs> yeah, you see, it didn't work, mate. There's no God. Hey, dude, why don't you get another drink? Yeah. Uh, ha! Ha! <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, it's still delayed, mate. I'm out! Hi, I'm Jonathan Conrath, an evangelist based in the UK. And uh, it's great to be with you here at the diner at the edge of the universe. Wow, I love that Epiphany's restaurant. Her steaks look amazing. Uh, don't you just love that? Anyway, look, here I am to talk to you uh, just about how not to stress out when it seems that things are out of your control. Things are just out of control. You know, I think uh, for all of us, we like to be in control to some measure or another, have some sense of order in our lives. And, you know, perhaps we like to have some nice surprises along the way, but definitely not the, the negative, nasty surprises like this coronavirus uh, thing that's been going around the world. And, and of course, just uh, threatening to destabilize our whole world, perhaps even our very existence. And so it's really important, you know, that for all of us, we learn how we can come to a place of peace, how we can come to a place of trust in God and know that he's got our life in his hands. That's a place where we can know freedom in our hearts and freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety. You know, the whole world is looking for peace and looking for stability, especially at a time when there's so much instability and so much fear that is uh, that's in the in the very center of this pandemic that's going on around the world. You know, for most of us, when we feel out of control, that's when anxiety can come knocking at the doors of our hearts and of our minds. And, uh, you know, the fear of illness, uh, job loss, maybe an unknown and uncertain future. You know, perhaps even the fear of death itself that somebody said is the perhaps the greatest fear and the mother of all fears is the fear of death itself. You know, back in the 1940s, uh, Corrie ten Boom, uh, a wonderful woman of God who endured the horror of the Nazi concentration camps, she made this amazing statement. She said, you know, you can trust an unknown future to a known God. What an amazing statement. You can trust an unknown future to a known God. And so today what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you three keys to help you not stress when things seem out of control. And the first one that I want to uh, to share with you is the simple truth that we must learn to trust that God has our lives in his hands. You know, uh, when Jesus was talking to us about not having anxiety in our lives, he said to us that um, he said that even the very sparrows that are in the fields around us, that even even the sparrows don't fall to the ground outside of your father's will. He said, and therefore, don't be afraid. He said, and you said you are of much greater value than many sparrows. And he's talking here about an active trust in God, not a kind of passive trust that kind of says, oh, well, yeah, my, my life's in God's hands. And so whatever comes along will be the will of God for my life. No, he's talking about actively trusting God to keep us safe in the palm of his hand, so to speak. Psalm 103 and verse 19, it says that God has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. What a powerful statement. We can put our trust in the fact that our God is the sovereign God, the almighty God, a, a powerful God who has got our lives in his hands. Psalm 139 and verse 16, it says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. This is even before we were born. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. So God actually says that, you know, he has a book about our lives and every one of our days was written in that book, even before we took our first breath. So we can trust that God has a good plan for our lives, that he intends good things for us, and that he has planned the days of our lives out even in advance. And we can trust him. He knows what he's doing. He's a good God. He's a personal God. And he loves us. And so that's absolutely wonderful. Yes, an amazing thing that uh, the expression fear not 
is mentioned 365 times in the Bible. That's an amazing reality. And that's kind of like it. God is trying to communicate to us not to be afraid. There is a statement there, fear not, an exhortation, fear not. Um, once for every day of the year, God wants us to trust him, you know, with our lives. That's absolutely amazing. And that's written in the context of us enjoying a strong relationship with a loving and a faithful God who we can know as Father when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now that means that we can know God not as a Father who is distant, not a Father who is abusive or a Father who is absent, but actually a Father who is personal, a God who loves us, a Father who knows us personally and that we can trust our lives into his hands. You know, I don't know what your experience of fatherhood was. For some people, you know, the very mention of the word father or dad is a negative association because their own experience of fatherhood was something that was negative or abusive or perhaps just absent. But, you know, our God is not an absent father. He is a personal father who can be known and trusted. He is a good God who will not hurt us. In fact, he told us in Jesus, Jesus told us about God, about God, the father. When he when he said this, he said, actually, in John chapter three, you know, verse 17, he said that the father sent the son not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And that tells us the very heart of God for us. You know, with regard to the coronavirus, there's all kinds of concepts and thoughts, ideas about that whole situation, about the virus that's just wrecking havoc in so many lives around the world. Some people think that it was man-made. Some people think, well, maybe it's a judgment from God. Well, I don't know what your perspective is, but what we can say right now is God is still on his throne. He loves us. He is there available to us, just as he always has been. In fact, when the Apostle Paul wrote a letter, you know, assuming it was Paul, many believe it was, who wrote this amazing letter to the Hebrews, he said this, he said that, let's come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So God has always made himself available to us. And through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for us on the cross to pay the price for all of our sins, that means that today we can come with confidence. We all know we've sinned. We all know we've messed up in life. But thank God that Jesus made the way for us, that we can come with boldness. He died in our place so that we can come freely and confidently into the presence of a God who wants to be father to us. And so we can know that he's for us and he is available to us to help us in our time of need. So number one, trust that God has your life in his hands. Number two, refuse to worry. Now, you know something that's easy to say, not so easy to do. But, you know, we can, again, choose to refuse to worry because when Jesus taught us not to worry, he said that to us in the context of teaching that he was giving us about our relationship with God as our loving father. I want to read to you this teaching of Jesus concerning worry. Uh, this is from the Gospel of Matthew, and it's chapter 6. And in chapter 6, starting verse 25, Jesus says these words. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of them. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, or you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the world seeks after all those things, and yet your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness 
and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, an old English preacher once said that anxiety is the dark room where our negatives are developed. And so, you know, I just want to encourage you today to live not in that dark room of worry, but instead to live in that light filled, hope filled, faith filled room of trust in God, our father who loves us. You know, sometimes that means we've actually got to say it. I don't know about you, but uh, but I find in my life sometimes I, I just need to say it. I need to use the words of my mouth to steer my thoughts and my emotions. The Bible actually says in James's letter that our tongues are a very powerful tool in our lives, that our, our tongue is like the rudder that is used on a, on a, on a ship. You know, maybe a ship could be in the middle of a storm under high winds, but you know, when you steer that rudder the right way, it's incredible how you can steer the way through the storm. And sometimes our emotions can feel like that, like great winds that, are, that have just kind of taken hold of our emotions and we barely feel we can control them of worry and fear and wondering, wondering what the outcome of the situation will be. But we need to learn to use our mouths at that time and choose to refuse to worry and say it say you know what I refuse to worry God loves me he's all powerful he's in control of the situation and I choose to trust God everything's going to be okay God is on my case he's turning this situation around for good and everything's going to be all right God is on my side you know when you start speaking words like that and trusting him everything starts to change peace comes into your heart and you begin to overcome in life and God has called us to be a people who choose to trust him. And last of all, we need to learn to pray with thanksgiving. You know, the Bible tells us not to worry about anything, instead to pray about everything and to do so with thanksgiving. We can respond personally and powerfully to the things that challenge us by turning to God in prayer. I want to read to you a few verses here from Philippians and uh, the Apostle Paul actually wrote this from a prison where he was actually waiting to hear as to whether or not the Romans were going to take his own life from him. So you can imagine this was a situation of high intensity. Uh, it's really a situation where, you know, you could really understand there was every reason why the Apostle Paul could feel anxious. And yet, despite that, you know, um, historians of the New Testament tell us that this is perhaps the most joy filled letter in the whole of the New Testament. An amazing, amazing letter. And in it, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. He's not telling them to rejoice in the situation, but he's telling them to rejoice in the Lord because the Lord never changes and he is always dependable. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness, your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. In other words, he's close by. He's near at hand. He's not at a distance. He's near to you, even as close as the air that you breathe. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That little phrase with thanksgiving is important. We all teach our children that when they're given a gift, that they should say thank you. And you know, thanksgiving really is the voice of faith. When we offer prayer to God, we need to thank him for the answer before we are yet seeing it, before we're yet experiencing it. That's the nature of faith. faith. Faith deals with the invisible. When you can see something and you're fully experiencing it, who needs faith then? But you need faith for what you can't see. But faith is the bridge, if you like, between the unseen realm, God's realm, the spiritual realm, and the natural realm of our lives that we contact through our five physical senses. And so when we start to put our trust in God and in his promises, 
then God's reality comes to invade the daily reality of our circumstances, feelings, emotions, etc. And it changes them. It brings, if you like, God's kingdom, his reign into the midst of the everyday experience of our lives and changes them. It brings peace where there's been anxiety, healing where there's been sickness, you know, a direction where there's been confusion, assurance where there's been fear. This is God's kingdom coming in. And guys, we need to learn to trust him, to pray and to pray with thanksgiving. There's a great promise attached to this. And it says this, when we do this, making our request known to God, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He's kind of using a picture here of two strong Roman soldiers, great sentries, all dressed up in their armor and fully equipped with their weaponry to guard your heart, the very center of your existence, of your life. Guard your mind, your thought realm, and guard your emotions, just to guard your heart and your mind and with the peace of God that passes all understanding. I had a friend who recently went to be with the Lord, you know, died of the coronavirus. Many of us pray we don't understand why he went on to heaven. But what I can say is that we he went on in perfect peace. You know, and even his family, although there was grieving, there was loss, he was in perfect peace. The testimony of his life was remarkable how God used it. You know, that uh, that even as he had the funeral and and the car came, of course, the hearse to collect his body and, 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 and all of this. Yet in the midst of that, the whole community, the whole town where he lived, lined the streets clapping and expressing gratitude for his life because he served his community in such a loving way, bringing the gospel and bringing the love of God in practical ways, just constantly being out there, sharing God's love in every way with those people. And yet the testimony of many lives who were there at his funeral, impacted by the gospel, lives being transformed because of the testimony of his life. And you know something, there's no defeat for the Christian. There's no defeat, there's no fear in facing eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men and deep on the inside of us. For every one of us, whether you are a believer in Christ or whether you're not yet a believer, yet there is deep on the inside of every one of us a certain knowing that there's more to life than just the nine to five grind, that actually God is, has created us to know him, that there is an eternity to come. It actually it starts in our lives the moment we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. You know, on the other side, so we can face death with certainty, with peace in our hearts. We don't have to fear death. But on the other side of that, there's also the fact that God is a miracle working God. We had a friend, even a member of our team who got the coronavirus and one of our evangelists, just faith rose in his heart. He got on the phone and he phoned him up and he just said to him, look, put a hand on your body right now. I'm going to do this for you guys in a moment. He said, put a hand on your body right now. I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus. And as he prayed, he felt enveloped by the power and the love and the peace of God. And every symptom left him. And he's since been totally confirmed, healed of coronavirus by the power of God. You know, we may not understand everything, why this one wasn't healed, but why that one wasn't, whatever else. But may I say this to you, that actually we can be confident in a God who is faithful, who is trustworthy, we can depend on him. He is a faithful God. He is still a miracle working God. I can remember years ago when my grandfather had bowel cancer and, you know, the medical world just said to him, you're going to have to take out the whole of your bowel and all of this. But we didn't want him to have to live with a colostomy, a bag for the rest of his life. You know, and actually we prayed for him in the name of Jesus with a fellow friend of ours, another pastor. And God totally healed him. And, you know, he was so healed. All the bleeding stopped. They took x-rays and the x-rays showed before prayer. Uh, you know, they showed a totally... Um, emaciated bowel, you know, just horrendous situation. They were going to have to, so it was an emergency to cut this out, to give him a colostomy and everything else. But after prayer, you know, he was totally healed, all the bleeding stopped. They took fresh x-rays. It just showed a perfect brand new bowel, healed by the power of God. You know, friends, miracles happen. And he hadn't had any medical intervention at all. The medical world said, this is a miracle. Only God could have done this. They said, we have to acknowledge that, even though they weren't yet 
they're Christians. Well, our God is a miracle working God. And, you know, there is a an urgency that we come to the Lord, that we trust in him. It's great that we can pray about the circumstances of life, that we can face death without fear. If we know the Lord, it's that we can actually put our trust in God for miracles of healing, that we can put our trust in God for miracles of provision and all of these wonderful things where God moves in our lives. However, there is a prayer that we need to pray that is the most important prayer of all. And it's the prayer to get right with God because sin, and we've all sinned, sin separates us from God. And there's an urgency to pray this prayer so that we get right with him. So our prayers are heard and answered. So the separation is no longer there. And Christ bridged the gap. You know, he lived a perfect life for us. And then he died a perfect death. The perfect blame, the son of God died hanging, bleeding on a cross for you and me. Dying in our place as a substitute, paying the penalty for all the sins you and I have ever committed, ever would commit. Christ died in our place as God's provision for our sins. It's not the end of the story. We know he was buried in a tomb. And three days later, he was raised, physically raised back to life again. The Bible says today gives an amazing promise. It says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Now that's the promise of God. And so in a moment, I'm going to pray this prayer with you. I urge you to pray it. Sometimes people think they've got all the time in the world to pray it. But you know something, there is an urgency. I've led many people to the Lord who died the very next day. And, uh, you know, I urge you to give your life to Christ today. You don't know what your future holds, but you do have now. I remember the great American evangelist Billy Graham being interviewed just literally last year. At the beginning of last year, he died. He went home to be with the Lord. And I can remember him being interviewed, you know, by a, uh, on TV. And as he was being interviewed, the interviewer said to him, he said, Dr. Graham, he said, you've lived nearly a 100 years. He said, a remarkable life. He said, um, you know, five times you've been, uh, you know, you've been voted to be the world's most admired man in Time magazine. You've been the friend of presidents. You've spoken to more people than any other human being face to face. And he said, uh, you know, at the end, coming to the end of your days, he said, you know, what's been the greatest surprise of your life? I thought it was a very interesting question. And Dr. Graham responded with characteristic um, accurate, it was sharpness, you know, in the way he responded. And these were his words. He just said, the greatest surprise of my life has been its brevity. Life is so short. You know, it seems like from there to a moment, one moment, we're just coming out of our mother's womb and taking our first breath. And the next moment, we're taking our last and we're facing eternity. The Bible says it's appointed a man once to die and then comes the judgment. And so when you stand before God, you know, what assurance will you stand with before him? You can be assured today that you will be accepted into heaven on one grounds and one grounds only. And those are the grounds that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as the son of God, as he is the one who died for your sins and rose again. You have made a choice to repent to turn from your sins, to follow Christ. And you have confessed him as Lord. You know, that Bible says if you do that, you'll be saved, most certainly. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to pray. And so as I pray this prayer, I invite you to pray it with me. Pray it right now and mean it in your heart. Jesus Christ will come into your life, forgive your sins and save you for eternity. Say these words after me right where you are. So Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you that you love me that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Lord, I believe in you and I confess that Jesus is Lord. Please come into my heart. Save me for eternity. I turn from my sins to follow you and I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. I will follow you the rest of my life. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for a new beginning. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Uh, guys, look, if you prayed that prayer, I bless you in the name of Jesus. I pray you would know his peace right now. That God's peace would fill your heart. That the certainty and assurance that your sins are forgiven would flood your life right now. And that actually from this moment on, that you would know the presence of God in your life. You can know this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until that final moment when you see it face to face. He'll never give up on you. So I want to encourage you, find a good church. You know, please be in touch with Josh Jen or with a 412 church near you. Get in touch with the guys and just say to them, I, you know, I've given my life to Jesus. I pray that prayer that John led us in at the end of that uh, that message. And um, they'll just be delighted to pray for you and help you in any way that they can. God bless you. Thanks for your time. But, you know, I want, I want to do just one last thing here for you, for you right now before we finish this short broadcast. I want to pray for you. Maybe you're depressed right now. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you're anxious about your finances, about your family. Maybe you're worried. Maybe you are actually ill yourself in your body. Maybe you're suffering from coronavirus or some other condition. I felt that God spoke to me earlier about someone who's watching this. You have a heart condition. You're worried about your health. You have high blood pressure. Um, you know, the, there's someone here even who has an aneurysm and uh, on, on the brain and you're really worried about your condition. There's somebody here, uh, you know, who has a problem with your shoulder and going into your spine, uh, you know, the day in your neck, your spine, all that area. You, you had an accident and you really damaged that area. God wants to heal you today. Um, I just uh, want to pray for somebody who, who is suffering with a breathing condition. It may be coronavirus, it may be asthma, I don't know. But I need to pray for someone with cancer right now. And you're worried you can't get to hospital, you're concerned if you go, you'll get coronavirus. And so you're, you're not going for, um, you know, for help right now. I'm going to pray for God to heal you. And if that's you, wherever you are, I want you just to put a hand on your body wherever you have the problem, whether I've spoken about the condition or not. But I, I want to pray for you. There's also several people who've felt suicidal um, recently. And I need to pray for you. Jesus is going to break the power of that off your life. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He loves you. He loves you. And he's going to set you free from this and give you his peace. He has a great purpose for your life. And you are dearly loved. He forgives you, restores you, and wants to make everything whole. Trust him now with your life. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for everyone who is watching this program right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke the sickness. I command it to go in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. I command coronavirus to leave in the name of Jesus. Be healed now in Jesus' name. I speak breath and life and healing into these lungs in the name of Jesus. Healing into that heart condition. Be totally healed in the name of Jesus. Let fear be dispelled. Let anxiety be lifted off you. I speak peace into your mind and into your heart, into your emotions in Jesus' name. Depression be gone and lifted. Suicidal thoughts and tendency cease right now in Jesus' name. And let love and joy, hope and purpose, peace fill your heart and mind now in Jesus' name. Father, for those who've damaged their bodies through accidents, Father God, those with arthritis or rheumatism, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Father, I speak complete healing into people's bodies now in the name of Jesus. That aneurysm be healed in Jesus' name. Any tumors dissolve and be healed in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for perfect healing. Even that stomach condition right now, that reflux, be healed in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for peace and for healing flowing now into each one who needs it. In the name of Jesus, Father, I praise you and thank you now for healing, wholeness, peace and freedom in Jesus' name. Maybe even some suffering with addictions today. Let them be broken. And let peace and freedom fill your life in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Thank you so much. Just take a bit of time to thank the Lord for your healing. Just try to do something you couldn't do before and give him praise. And please get in touch and let us know what the Lord's done in your life. God bless now. And thanks so much for your time.
guys, well done on making it all the way this far. Um, I wonder if God touched you as you're listening to Jonathan Conrath, if a part of your body was healed, maybe a part of your soul was healed, maybe something in your spirit breathed for the first time. I hope so, guys. And if it did, um, and you really feel impacted by this, hit us up on this number, guys. The Zoom rooms are about to open up and we can hang out, we can chat. We'd love to give you guys some first steps on how do you start this journey uh, with Jesus. But if nothing happened and uh, you actually feel further away from believing anything than you did when you started watching this video clip, I want to say that's also okay. Uh, it's not about a specific result and suddenly like, I'm a priest. All I would say is search for the truth with an open mind. Because if this whole thing is real, right? Jesus says he is the truth. So if you're searching for the truth, you're going to find him. That's my last little charge to you guys over there. Thank you so much for joining us. Those Zoom rooms are about to happen right now. And if you're watching this 100 years in the future, hit us up on this number, we can chat. Take it from there, guys. Mate, can I come on a Zoom? Can I join it on a Zoom, mate? Yeah, you can, you can come as well, dude. Yeah? Yes, you can come, dude. Anybody is welcome. <laughs> no one's ever invited me to anything before in my life, mate. Thank you. I'll see you next time on episode two, where we talk about does my life have a purpose?